STEM fans, are you ready? Let's hear it for the world class NASA STEM Stars team. From NASA centers across the country, we present Philip Hargrove. Welcome to our 32nd edition of NASA STEM Stars webinar. I'm your host, Lynn Dotson, an education specialist at Kennedy Space Center. And joining us today is Philip Hargrove, a launch vehicle trajectory analyst at Kennedy Space Center. And we're coming to you live from various locations. NASA STEM Stars allows students to connect firsthand with scientists, engineers, innovators from around the NASA centers to learn different career pathways, opportunities, and missions. Check out hashtag NextGenSTEM. So here is your mission for today. We're actually going to meet Philip and the, the, the NASA STEM star that he is. We're going to explore his career. You're going to get a chance to ask your questions along the way. And at the end, we'll learn about a mission that you can do. And next on NASA STEM stars. So be sure to stick around till the end so our NASA STEM star can uh, answer your questions. And I'll have a fun mission for you to do, my kind of like a homework assignment. So just remember, you can put your chat questions in the chat and we will get to those as we can. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Philip Hargrove. Philip, thank you so much for being here today. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to, to be here and to be able to talk with some students. So um, yeah, I guess we can just get right into it. So, um, so yeah, my name is Philip, and I work as a launch vehicle trajectory analyst at Kennedy Space Center. And I'll talk a little bit about my job. Um, but in our slides, I have some just some of my interests and hobbies. Uh, some of these things change. Uh, you know, especially, you know, spending a lot more time at home nowadays. I listen to a lot of music, watch a lot of TV. Um, I'm really into comedies. I've been into uh, reading a lot more books now lately, which has been really fun. Some fiction books, some sci-fi books, and then other just like novels and, and other things like that. Um, some of my favorite things lately have been doing yoga and meditation. That's been just a great part of kind of keeping days feeling healthy. Uh, and then going to the beach, that's one of the best parts about living in Florida because I'm, I'm just about 30 minutes from the beach. And I'll actually talk a little bit about that um, in a few slides. Um, I like recreational sports. So that's one thing that might connect to uh, or connect with some of our younger students. So it turns out that kickball is one of those sports that you, you play when you're in elementary school and then you never play it again until you get to your late 20s and you want something that's athletic and can help you make friends. So you just join a random kickball league. So, so I've been doing that lately, and that's really fun. And then I also like uh, like very, very amateur astronomy. I love going out at night, and especially when you can see the planets. Like right now, you can see Jupiter and Saturn and Mars in, in, the, um, in the evening sky. So that's just always a really fun, a really fun thing to do. Absolutely. And this the last Halloween was a full moon. It was beautiful. Um, so cool that you have all of those amazing interests and you just seem like a well-rounded person. Um, but we want to little bit know a little bit more about how did you get to where you are today? Sure. So, yeah, you can look at some of these pictures uh, to kind of see my my journey kind of from the beginning up until now. So this picture from 2004 ish. Uh, I was a little kid at you know space camp. I was always really into space and NASA and just wanted to learn everything about it. So I was really fortunate that my my parents knew that and they um, they were you know able to to send me to these types of camps where I could be like a mission controller. Uh, and then you fast forward 13 years to 2017 when I first started at NASA and I was still kind of faking it. So this is in the Boeing Starliner capsule mock-up. Uh, that's that's here at Kennedy. This was just a few years ago, uh, and then you fast forward again to just this past summer, where I was, you know, definitely a lot closer to you know really doing the real thing because I actually was on the team that that analyzed the trajectories for the Mars 2020, the Perseverance rover launch, 
So I actually got to be there the day that they rolled the rocket out from, uh, rolled it out to the launch pad right before launch. And oh, if you go to the next that slide. Is, that's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it was, that was one of the best days. I, I hope I never forget that. Um, so, so yeah, this slide shows uh, just some of the things along the way, especially when I was in college and in grad school. So, um, so I went to Stanford for undergrad and I did aerospace engineering literally because it has the word space in it. And I just knew that I wanted to study about space. And I was fortunate to get an internship at JPL, which is the, the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab um, in Southern California. And one of the really fun parts about being there for the summer was getting to see the, the Deep Space Network or the DSN uh, satellite dish um, facility. So you can see here, they had these, these satellite dishes that are over 200 feet in diameter. And that's actually how we communicate with spacecraft that are deep, deep in, in space. And you can you know, see my tiny little body right there next to it. So that was definitely a, a sight to see. And then a couple of years after that, I actually got to work on CubeSats, which are you know these small satellites. This one that I was working on was just about the size of a loaf of bread. And um, we were in the really early planning stages for that one, but it was really cool because just a few years after that, after I had already moved on from that project and I had started working here in Florida, that spacecraft actually launched on a Falcon Heavy just last year. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to the next hey, slide. Oh, sure. Just, I was just gonna say, there's already some huge, some questions coming in and they're very excited about what you like to read. So one of the, one of the students asked, what kind of books do you like to read? Um, since you said you're a book lover. Sure. So, yeah, one of the fun things about kind of rediscovering my desire to read, I read a lot when I was younger and then I kind of stopped throughout college and I've started it again recently. So it really just depends on your mood. Sometimes I want something really light or even funny. Um, so I wish I had brought it next to me so I could show you, but I have a book called um, The Thing Explainer. And it's the book where they, I can't remember what the number is, but he, the author describes stuff using only like the top 1000 words in the English language or something like that. So he, you can't go, so like the top 100 or 1000 used words in the English language. So it really like simplifies everything. So it's fun to think about learning random stuff. There's a whole diagram of the Saturn V rocket and they call it the upgoer five because rocket is not in that list of the top 1000 words. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of a fun one. Um, I like to, I mean, I like to learn about, you know, just kind of learning how to be a human. So there's a lot of books that I read about like, just kind of, yeah, growing as a person and becoming more, uh, just a better person every day, I guess. And then also some sci-fi yeah. books. I love The Martian. That's one of my favorite ones. Oh, that um, one's a good read, one. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't, I I couldn't put that one down. <laughs> yeah, especially because the, you know, the, the trajectory analyst is the one who saved the day. So I loved getting to read that. <laughs> It was just like you in a movie. It's awesome. So uh, another exactly. question, what, inspi what inspired you? Um, and if you have tips for others, any further readings or researching, researching uh, stuff to research if they want to kind of go into the path that you went into? Hmm. What was your ins inspiration? Well, That's Yeah. Um, so I, I, like I said, I was always interested in space and I just liked learning about the planets and everything like that. And I knew that NASA existed. So it was like, oh, if I want to keep doing this, I, I want to work for NASA. But I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was, it was my third year of college and I took an orbit mechanics class and I just thought it was really fun. I, I thought it was really cool stuff. I understood it. I liked, I liked the professor um, and I liked the way that it was intuitive. So I, I decided that I wanted to just keep learning about that. So I took that class in 2013 and here I am now seven years later um, learning the same or like working on that same stuff. So, you know, in terms of advice, I would just say keep learning stuff until you find something that is super exciting to you. And if you want to keep learning about it, just go for it and don't uh, don't be afraid if it's too difficult or anything like that. Just really challenge yourself. If, if something is interesting to you, you should go after it. So um, speaking of that, um, you, there is a slide, I think it's the next slide of you trying something new that you've never done before and how'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> right, so this was a couple of years ago. It was the first time that I tried um, surfing. 
So one of those, okay, I live in Florida now, so I guess I should do this. And I mean, you can see even the first picture on the left, I I was kind of doomed from the beginning. The front of the board is already under the water, but I was trying it. That's actually one of my NASA coworkers standing next to me who was teaching me how to do it. Um, And it was a pretty, pretty epic, you know, crash and burn. And I, you know, I remember the, the, the board hit me in the head. So it was, uh, but it, it's it's just kind of a representation of how, yeah, when you're trying new things, sometimes it hurts, sometimes it doesn't work out, but a big part of it is just getting back on that board or, you know, I grew up in Texas, so we always said get get back on that horse. Um, so, so yeah, it's like expect to have some failure, expect to have some some rough goes, but if you really want to do it, you should just keep on trying. Yeah, that's absolutely the best advice. Um, keep trying, keep trying, and try stuff new. I mean, it's that's very inspiring that you're you're doing that, and you tried surfing because I know that's hard stuff. Um, so, if we talk a little bit about where you are today, um, there's another slide talking about like your other coworkers and um, your first day of work. So, give us a little bit of background on that. Sure. Yeah. So this picture, the one on the left is my first day at NASA, obviously a super exciting day. Uh, And it was just really cool to work in a building like this where, you know, you see the big logo and there's like an astronaut suit behind me and stuff. And the picture on the right is me and three other coworkers who all got hired at the same time. So we all got to go through orientation together. And it was was really fun to be able to just learn with a group of people and to dive into this new experience with kind of a team because that was something that didn't happen at the first job that I had where I was kind of, I had a sort of a unique hiring situation. So I kind of came in by myself, Um, but it was really great to just, yeah, talk with them and, you know, go through challenges together and help each other prepare for our first big presentations when we, um, you know, had finished our first like orientation session. So. Very cool. So um, the next question actually leads um, into, there's actually a question that goes into how, um, what you actually do. So what does a launch trajectory um, analyst do for a vehicle? And one of the questions I'm sure you might touch on as we go through this is um, what kind of programs do you use to actually uh, use, make the trajectory? So a little bit of, uh, right. of more information and deeper, deeper. And that's a deep question. So I'm interested to know too. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. So, so this, these diagrams just sort of show um, what my job looks like kind of from, from a high level. So, you know, NASA wants to send a rover to well, really humanity wants to send a rover to, to Mars. And I, I say that because there's, you know, all the different, a lot of different countries are involved in, in this rover and, you know, it's really a collaboration. Um, so especially in terms of the science, so we have this big spacecraft that we need to get all the way to Mars and we have this big rocket that is, is tasked with getting there and the launch services program, which is the the big program that I work with, we are just a part of the team that helps put those pieces together and the trajectory analysts specifically, we're, uh, are a part of the team to just make sure that the rocket puts the spacecraft where it's supposed to go at the right time, going the right speed and the right direction. So if you go to the next slide really quick, you can see sort of one of my representations of what my job feels like where, you know, I'm just, I've got numbers flying in front of my face and, uh, you know, we're really just trying to make sure that the math makes sense. So when it comes to tools, um, actually, if you go to the next slide, you can see a representation or, or a good analogy that I normally use, which is, you know, when you think of the word trajectory, you can just think of a path uh, it, it's the path that you take to get where you're trying to go. So the same way that you have to plan out your path when you're driving a car and you have a lot of different things to consider, it's the same thing for you know a rocket going on its path from the launch pad all the way up into space. So you know you have things like curves that you have to go around. Those are your trajectory events, and that's similar to just the way that the rocket flies. So it, it burns until the first stage is out of fuel and then it drops that first stage off and it keeps on going. You have different constraints like speed limits, either maybe places that you can't go, a school zone where it's a specifically low speed limit. Uh, For a rocket, we have atmospheric constraints. You may be limited in your launch window by clouds or other things, you know, wind in the environment and your aerodynamic loads. Uh, Then you have your controls. So the same way that you steer a car and you have to control the acceleration, you have to do that for a rocket too. 
Um, and instead of, you know, thinking of it as like a gas pedal, we have like throttling on the rocket. And then, you know, right. at the very end, you have your efficiency. So you want to make sure that you get where you're going efficiently so you can maximize your science return and you know, basically not waste a lot of gas. So there are some trajectory analysis tools that basically just take in all the physics equations of how a rocket flies and how the, uh, the atmosphere works and everything like and, and how the planets move. Um, all of those tools are put together and we, we use those. Um, one of them is called GMAT. There's one called Free Flyer, one called STK. Um, there's a lot of different tools that we use for that. But then when it comes to like processing the data and crunching the numbers, we use Excel and MATLAB really just to, um, you know, run, run the trajectory through and make sure it did what it's supposed to do. Wow. So not rocket science at all, right? <laughs> Seems like it's me. <laughs> But I like that the way that you showed, um, you related it to just driving a car. It's, it's a little bit harder than that, I think, but um, but that was a really good way to to demonstrate it to, to students. So um, if we're gonna keep going with the whole launch trajectory analyst and what exactly you've done, uh, what kind of things you've worked on, um, but man, the questions are flying in. So a lot of them, one of them actually said, was there something really challenging um what was the most challenging part of doing your job um what's the hardest part of it so thinking about uh, maybe one of the specific missions that i got to work on so I, I talked about working on the mars 2020 rover um we so if you're going to launch something to mars you know it, it comes to your launch season you know the planets are lining up and you have maybe 30 days or so to get your 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 rocket off of the ground before you may have to wait another two years. So what that means is that we analyze launch opportunities on a lot of different days. And depending on what rocket we fly and how we plan things out, we may have a lot of different launch opportunities, like different launch times that you can go on a, on a given day. So that means that we just have countless trajectories to, to analyze and to, and to verify. So I think the number was like, 800, we had like 800 trajectories that we had to verify. So we had to put together tools to um, process all of that data and, you know, look at it. And if, if you had to make tweaks to anything, we had to be uh, familiar enough with the programs to, to be able to go in and do that. So, um, so it's the type of job where you need to be really detail oriented and uh, make sure that you're not like skipping over things because because yeah, we want to know that any time that we have the ability to launch, we want to be confident and be able to express confidence that that that, yeah. that trajectory is good. Um, so, so that's one um, thing. And then I'll- of, Go ahead. There's just well, yeah, so I was just gonna kind of feed it into like, this. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna feed it into the slide that we're looking at, because this is a unique yeah. challenge that is, um, that's really the we're facing more and more because we want to utilize all of the efficiency that we can get from these rockets. So if you have leftover performance on a given rocket, you may want to add uh, what we call a ride share or a secondary payload. So I've gotten to work on a mission um, you know, from those on that next slide that we were looking at. It's launching in a couple of years. So we have the primary payload that's gonna be an earth orbiting satellite from NOAA that's gonna help us understand our planet better. And then we have this mission called Lofted, which is out of uh, NASA Langley. And that's basically a reentry science test. And um, the idea is that you want to have this big inflatable heat shield that allows you to bring bigger stuff to Mars. Like right now, you're kind of confined by the size of the nose cone on the rocket. But if you're able to inflate your heat shield, you can slow down a lot more easily and potentially bring more stuff to Mars. So that's what this picture on the very right is, just like a, a concept. So figuring out how to make two missions work together like that can be pretty difficult, but it's a it's a fun part of the job because you get to work with a lot of different people and come up with new ideas and explore options. So it's it's challenging, but I've really enjoyed that part of it. Very cool. Um, so one of the questions that you said you got to work with a lot of people, I guess you've obviously made some some pretty good friends working where you work. Um, and you probably even one of them took you out surfing. So the, the question was, like, are, is it is it a fun place to work? Like, is, is it fun being at NASA? Um, people say it is. But like, tell us a little bit about the the actual life at Kennedy Space Center. 
Yeah, I, I really don't think there's anything like it. I mean, driving into work and seeing, uh, you know, even just the visitor center where there's the big model of the shuttle um, external tank and the side boosters. I remember for the first two years that I worked here, I drove in and I was like, when is this going to get old? I was asking myself, like, when is it going to get old to be able to see this stuff every day? Um, and then things happen like you are trying to leave work and you're late for a flight. You got to drive all the way into Orlando for a flight and you get stuck behind this convoy because they're bringing in like the European service module. So they, it's just this huge piece of hardware that's going to go on SLS. Um, so you have these moments where it's like, wow, all of this stuff is going to happen right here. So I think the launch day excitement is one of my favorite things about the job. I love, you know, if there's a launch while we're at work, you, you know, people just kind of scream out of the building and we, we watch from the parking lot or from a stairwell where we can be kind of elevated and stuff. So that's, that's always really fun. And it's, it's cool to be invested in what you're doing and for everybody to be excited about the type of work that we're doing. So NASA's mission is super exciting. So it's, it's, it's cool to have coworkers who are interested in it too and to be able to do that together. Absolutely. Yeah. Every, every time when you could feel it in the air when there's a launch day. Absolutely. And I'm sure it's even more exciting when you were the one that came up with the trajectory, especially the Mars 2020. Um, they were going to, one of them was asking about, um, did you work on the actual robot for Mars 2020? And I, I think I know the answer to this, but they wanted a little clarification. <laughs> Yeah, no. So so the people who worked on the robot were mainly at JPL, the NASA Center in California. So that's where they actually built it. Um, I was sort of uh, working with them and the people um, who, who, were, who built the rockets. And I was kind of just like a part of that team of three. So, so yeah, I didn't do anything with the actual rover itself, but it was pretty cool because a few friends of mine from graduate school um, at Michigan, they did get to work on the rover. So it, it's awesome to have, you know, it's kind of small world where people from all over end up being able to contribute to it. Very neat. Very neat. I know you were involved in the social media aspect of it too. And a lot of the launches that, so you, you'll probably have seen uh, Phillips face a lot if you guys tune into NASA um, social media. Um, but uh, we're, I think we're at the time. Oh, it's only two twenty-two, So we have a couple more questions. Um, did you want to, finish with this slide. Is there anything you didn't touch on? That's a big, there's a rocket, obviously two rockets that are launching there. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I can. Um, the, the, the reason I put together this slide like this is just to show just the variety of what we're doing. I mean, it's, this is two of the, you know, uh, two of the rockets that we've flown on recently. And then these are just a few missions that I've gotten to work on and they're all doing completely different things that are doing amazing science. Uh, for NASA and for humanity. So like I said, JPSS is the one that's studying Earth. Uh, we have one called IMAP that's launching in a few years, uh, actually like four or five years, and um, it's going to study the solar winds. We have Mars 2020 that's all the way, already on the way to Mars. And then um, I was able to be on, on the team for a little while for Psyche, which is going to study an all-metal asteroid. So that'll be a really cool mission too that's launching in a couple of years. So so yeah, NASA is doing a lot of really fun science and there's there's a lot of places for people's curiosity to take them. Um, I guess we have a curious uh, student here that says, which planet, if you could choose a planet to live on, which one would you live on? I don't know yeah, if you've I ever been you asked that question. My... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so it's funny because I've been asked like, what's your favorite planet? Um, and you know, I don't know if you can see my picture behind me um you can see jupiter right there so that's my favorite planet if i can get my finger right yeah <laughs> so that's actually a painting yeah. that um actually an, actually a nasa intern made that painting for me it's incredible and if you can see it up close wow. it it has the um it has the juno uh spacecraft which is the one that's studying jupiter right now i just think that's the coolest planet it's my um it's my phone background i would so i would love to you know go to europa which is the so obviously jupiter is made of gas so you couldn't like stand on it but um, you know, Europa has that ice sheet, so you could at least stand on it. Wouldn't be healthy for you. Not the safest place, right. but I, I would love to. <laughs> I would love to visit there. All right, Jupiter, it is. So um, they're they're also interested in knowing if you've ever been uh, or seen or been a part of a rocket exploding. You know, there's failures sometimes. So have you been 
a part of that or is that that was before your time no rockets no i know you said that you were they kept scrubbing launches because you were out of town and when you got back they finally launched one so do you right. i'm sure you there's failures but uh anything you've seen mm. in person no i've never seen a failure in person i hope i'm not forgetting something major uh but yeah i never saw one in person um but that is one interesting thing about nasa is that it almost feels like I have because we uh, we really make sure that we share the knowledge and and learn from our mistakes and just learn from the things that go wrong. So um, you know we get training on some of the failures that have happened with NASA and we we continue to learn even if it's not a launch associated with NASA. If one of our launch companies um, has a failure or has something that they're struggling with, you know we want to know about it so we can be part of the solution and then also just sort of increase our knowledge and, and know if that's something we should look yeah. out for in the future. Absolutely, lessons learned for sure. Um, uh, they said when you are, were little, did you know you wanted to work at NASA? I, I mean, I don't. I never remember a time when I didn't want to be an astronaut. I always wanted to do that. Um, so, so yeah, I, I was always. I remember I had this big book um, that I actually just found at my mom's house recently. Um, this giant book or binder that had all these pictures of of the planets and all the moons and everything that we knew about space. Um, and at that time, we had we had just launched the Spirit and um, Opportunity rovers to Mars. Uh, so this was back in the early 2000s. So, you know, we were still learning a lot about that planet and, and I, just, I just wanted to know more. So yeah, I think I kind of always knew. Cool. I think we have one more slide of you at NASA. Uh, and what it's like to work life at NASA. We've already kind of touched on that, but if you want to kind of explain some of these pictures. They're very interesting to me. Yeah, so I guess I'll go from right to left. So just the variety of things that go on. So on the right, um, that's me doing social media for one of our launches a couple of years ago. So getting to send out tweets for NASA is just kind of one of those pretty cool things that you do. The one in the middle was the March 2020 launch. So just a few months ago. Um, so, you know, it was a little rough because the, the rocket was basically launching right towards the sun from my direction. So, but it was still a really cool view. So again, just being this close to everything is really awesome. And then the one on the left, so it looks like we're holding like dirty dish rags, but so that's actually, um, that's actually these mittens that the astronauts used to clean up. Um, I, I believe it was like some metallic debris that was on the International Space Station. Uh, due to like some grinding that was happening on some ball bearings. So they had to clean it up because it was creating some sort of, um, you know, dangerous magnetic environment. Um, so they they did that cleaning and then they actually brought um, those materials back to Kennedy and they, you know, were doing testing and stuff here. So it was pretty cool to be able to hold something that was actually in space. Um, so again, that's me and those, those few coworkers who all got started at the same time, so. Very nice. Well, um, I was gonna say we can, um, Now's the time for questions. However, um, there's only about two minutes left. So we've asked, uh, you guys have asked a lot of great questions along the way. Um, and I think we've covered most of them. Um, if we haven't, we are sorry. We're getting to the point of uh, our final thoughts. So, um, you know, we've been so happy to talk to you today, Philip. You have obviously um, a lot of knowledge and you are, have a lot of uh, great stories to share. Um, and we really appreciate your time with us. And I know our future NASA STEM, NASA STEM stars out there are excited that you joined us today. Um, I'm gonna give you guys now uh, a homework assignment. I know it's the worst, wah, wah. but here it goes. Uh, we actually want you to get excited and get on and do some hands-on activities. So what we're hoping that you will do here is actually design and track a rocket. Um, and these, uh, there'll be a ch in the chat, there will be a link that you can click on and it will allow you to design fins. Uh, this is part of our Moon to Mars um, SLS uh, module. And so we would love for you to try to design a rocket with the, with the fins. And then once you launch it, track it. Um, and then we would love for you to share your work on our social media. So you would just put in there that you designed and tracked a launch or a rocket and uh, you would place the hashtag next gen stem and maybe you'll see your work somewhere published um, and of course we also want you to tune in for next week so if you want to check out next week's uh, NASA stem star it's going to be an exciting one 
we have Dr. John Mather, who is a Nobel laureate for astrophysics. So um, this guy is going to blow your mind. He um, works with the James Webb Telescope, and that will be November 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, so final thoughts. I am just, again, so thankful that you're here with us, Philip, today. Um, I love that you work at Kennedy Space Center. I get to see you sometimes. And um, we want to thank you. Uh, also, NASA STEM stars out there and any teachers that are tuning in. Um, if you don't want to miss another episode, you, all you have to do is just push the subscribe button down there um, on the YouTube, and we would love to see you guys next week for next NASA STEM stars. Until then, take care.